7 o'clock. Um, I call the meeting to order, City of University Heights City Council meeting. Today is Tuesday, February 11th. Uh, thank you all for coming today. Uh, there's five council present. And uh, then we have approval of minutes for January 14th, the regular council meeting, and February 6th, the special council meeting. Uh, I'll just start to see if there's any uh, uh, additions, and we'll just do it together if there aren't. Are there any additions or corrections to either January 14th or February 6th meeting minutes? Hearing none, the meetings, minutes are approved for both meetings by unanimous consent. Okay, uh, today I have a proclamation, the 19th Amendment Centennial Commemoration Proclamation. And it's on the website, it's a very nice proclamation. I'd, you should read it all, but I'm gonna read parts of it today. Whereas the fight for women's suffrage from the first Women's Rights Convention to enfranchisement lasted more than 72 years with women from all walks of life, political views, and demographic backgrounds asking for the right to voice their opinions at the polls. And whereas Iowa women by the thousands advocated for the right to vote. Whereas it took male allies to support women in their endeavor to vote for it was sons, husbands, and fathers who ultimately heard the calls of women and the House of Representatives took a historic vote on May 21st, 1919, followed by the Senate on June 4th, 1919, and three-fourths of the states needed to ratify the 19th Amendment. And whereas Iowa was the 10th state to ratify the 19th Amendment. Whereas women are running for office in unprecedented numbers, many current politicians, both male and female, remember that they follow in the footsteps of these great suffragettes and resolved the city of University Heights commemorates the 100th anniversary of the passage and ratification of the 19th Amendment providing for women's suffrage to the Constitution of the United States. Therefore, citizens of University Heights shall enjoy the freedom of voter participation, continue to fight for voting rights for all citizens, celebrates this important milestone by proclaiming the calendar year 2020 to be the 19th Amendment Centennial Commemoration. And we have three women here from the League of, two of them, from the League of Women Voters. And I know Karen Franklin, because she's our own Karen Franklin, and Vicki's here, too. Vicki Aiden. Aiden. And so uh, I want to present the proclamation to you. around or did you want to say anything? Yes. Okay. Thank you so much. Are you Cindy? I am. Hi Cindy. Yeah. Cindy Conger. Yes. <laughs> well we'll see what yeah, hello. <laughs> On behalf of the 19th Amendment Centennial Commemoration, 5050 and 2020, the Iowa Women's Foundation, and the League of Women Voters of Johnson County, we thank the City of University Heights for passing this proclamation. After 100 years of struggle, the ratification of the 19th Amendment in 1920 was and is a monumental achievement, one that merits attention, education, and promotion throughout the Iowa and the nation. The gains, hard won. The status today, not done. The future is calling to help, to help learn from the past. The City of University Heights has heard this call and answered. Thanks. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you for coming. 
Okay, and now we have a uh, public input time. Uh, I ask that there you speak no lo more than five minutes, and uh, you only speak once during the meeting, and you can speak for 30 seconds or five minutes, whatever you want, and uh, you can come up and address the council and uh, give your name and address, please. Thank you for coming, and who would like to Who'd like to speak tonight? Okay, well, thank you. Uh, good evening, council Hi. members. I'm Kyle Vogel. Uh, I know some of you, some of you I don't, but um, I am the president managing broker of Keystone Property Management in Iowa City. I am also on the Greater Iowa City Apartment Association Board of Directors. I'm here tonight representing both parties. Um, First, from the Keystone property management side, we do uh, have about a dozen to 18 clients who uh, own residential investment properties in the city boundaries of University Heights. Uh, some of those at Grandview Court condominiums, um, and some of those single family homes, um, you know, Melrose, Highland, Cozer in the area as well. Um, we are concerned somewhat about some of the proposals being being offered up tonight as part of the rental housing code ordinance changes. Um, in particular, um, questions of the, the parking requirement for people 18 plus, um, the trash and recycling bin question of where to store those when they're not being um, out at the curb. Um, those are kind of some of the big ones. Um, Part of our issue comes with the fact that this is not being equally applied to all members and owners in University Heights. This is obviously something that is directed at rental properties and investment properties and at those people who rent property in University Heights who either can't afford a home on their own or they're here in a temporary time frame for school or work or for whatever purpose. Um, you know, it, it is unfair to focus and, and single out a group of people that have done nothing wrong aside from not being homeowners. Um, you can drive around today in University Heights, which I did for about an hour this afternoon, and you can find numerous homeowners on Melrose Court and Olive Court and Lemur Court and Highland and Grand who don't have garages, only have carports that don't have a place to store their trash and recycling, those people, their cans are still going to be out week long as homeowners, whereas the rental properties three doors down or the investment properties around the corner, you know, have to drag their cans all the way around to the back of their house because they don't have a garage or they don't have a place to put it in a garage. Um, same way with the long driveways, the 18 plus, um, you know, in 2007, uh, Ames Rental Property Association versus the City of Ames had a had a court case, and and one of the arguments there was, families today, especially ones with teenagers, are just as likely as a group of unrelated persons to have numerous vehicles parked outside their home. In fact, in a college community, students, the unrelated persons most targeted by ordinances such as these, are more likely to rely on alternative means of transportation, public transportation, foot or bicycle than a vehicle. Manifestly restricting um, single family housing based generally on legal relationships between its inhabitants bear no reasonable relation to the goals of reducing parking and traffic problems, controlling population density and preventing noise and disturbance. Um, this was the 2007 case that originally started off the argument about unrelated uh, people, but part of that argument was parking regulations used as zoning ordinances, once again, to target rental properties unequally and unfairly against the basis of homeowners in the same area. Uh, I'd like to point you to the city of Iowa City. For example, their beautification program. Um, one of the agreements we made with the city when we discussed that original program was that it was evenly applied to all homes and all homeowners, and that's what Iowa City has done. Iowa City does not go out and just cite rental properties for tall grass or for trash cans not on the side of the house or for you know if you're a homeowner you have to abide by the same rules that the city asks investor properties and investor owners to do um, and I guess that's 
kind of where I'm coming from today where um, you know you are looking my owners my clients are looking at you know uh, building uh, building enclosures around dumpsters or that kind of thing that's you know are looking at outlays of 300 400 dollars for that kind of stuff for properties that that takes um, also need I guess kind of want to talk about the interconnectivity of smoke detectors and there's another one where if it's a safety issue it should be to everybody everybody in the city should have interconnected smoke alarms whether they be wireless or not to ask an investor owner who's already on a margin to spend anywhere from 400 to 700 dollars for 10 smoke detectors and a carbon monoxide because that's what they are they're anywhere from 40 dollars to 50 dollars a piece for the interconnected wireless is a burden you're asking a subset of individuals you have 30 seconds a subset of individuals in this town to pony up for that you're not asking everybody to do and it's not fair it's not fair to once again single out a group of people who do pay property taxes who do add to the betterment of this community but do feel like they're being targeted in this case so thank you for your time and thank you for consideration thank you mr vogel would anyone else like to speak to the council Okay, uh, public input is closed now, and we'll go on to um, the presentation of city examination uh, to mayor and council, and welcome John Olson. Uh, thank you for coming, John, and every the council has the report in front of them. Thank you, Mayor, and good evening to everybody. Um, I'm, as was mentioned, my name is John Olson. I'm the president of Kronlagi and Olson CPAs, a local CPA firm out of Charles City, Iowa. And we did do the annual examination of City of University Heights. Purpose of that examination is to perform a check on the processes within the city rather than focusing on revenues, expenses, and fund balance. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is not a full audit that was performed. This is an annual examination of the City of University Heights looking at items that the state auditors requires. Our examination procedures were all set by the state auditor's office. And unlike an audit, there is no materi materiality level. This translates to if we find any non-compliance, we are required to report the non-compliance along with the recommendation. We are not allowed the professional judgment to determine if a report, report comment is warranted. The report is a five-page report that includes a listing of city officials on page one. It includes our independent accountant's report on applying agreed upon procedures on page two and three which, it, again, it provides no opinion or assurance on the city's operations. It, however, it does provide the detail of the procedures that we performed. The last couple pages are detailed recommendations, and these are minor non-compliance issues that we had that we had noted. First one is segregation of duties. This will always be a concern in a city, in a city of this size. There's simply not enough, not enough budget there to hire everybody to segregate everything financial. Um, bank reconciliations. Um, the one thing that we noticed there was no documentation that the review was done uh, with the initial and date. It goes by that old saying, if it was, if it's not documented, it didn't happen. Uh, deposits, investments, uh, depository resolution should be, um, should be reviewed annually. It was, this didn't happen, but it was completed after year end. So next year when we, when we do this, that comment will be gone. Uh, certified budget, we did exceed two, two service areas during the year. Um, 
just a reminder to keep an eye on the budget and amend it before you before you exceed transfers transfers were documented however they need to be approved by council prior to the actual transfer Unca unclaimed property of old stale checks that haven't been cashed yet by the payees this is being worked on by cities by the city and this is part of the great Iowa treasure hunt and we did notice a part of our the part of our procedures was to verify that the wages were being paid everybody's wages were being paid what they what was approved and we noticed there was one employee whose salary was thousand dollars more than what what it was we know it's a it's a typographical error but there again we don't have any we don't get any judgment when we do these it's it's either compliance or non-compliance and basically just have somebody else it could be a council member. Uh, and, uh, Lori brought up the question to me yesterday about who would be a good person to do that. Well, Chris or anybody that just double checks the amounts would be fine. And that has been corrected. Could it be two people, not the same person all the time? Yeah. I mean, you know, if somebody, it could be me and maybe the finance chair, yes, whoever's available. Any, all council members would be, it doesn't matter who, it's just a matter of, did the check get done? Okay, it's, so it doesn't matter the number. No, it doesn't the matter the number, of, okay, the number of you. people that look at it, just as long as somebody does. And I, as I was explaining to Lori, yes, it's not. It was a typographical error, but the fact that I posed the question, would it have been found? And it's, it probably would have gotten found after, after the year end when they were putting in the new, the new uh, salaries for the next year. That's probably when it would have been discovered. So it's just a good control to review those things ahead of time, just as a double check. Mm -hmm. And I would like to thank city personnel for their assistance during our examination. It went real smooth this year. Um, it, it went really good. Any questions? You answered mine. I was <laughs> wondering about that. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Well, John, I know you have a couple hour drive. <laughs> and uh, if we have any other questions, we can always contact you. Yes, either by phone, email. Right. Or you can make the trip up to Charles City if you want to. Okay. <laughs> in the winter. In the, yeah, in the winter. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Okay, now we're going to discuss the uh, FY21 budget, and Steve had brought a worksheet, a budget worksheet, and uh, it's in front of all the council here, and so you want to start, Steve, do you want to go up to the microphone, uh, or do you well, want to I'm sit there? I'm okay, okay here. Very good. Lots of paper. Okay. Um, first thing I want to... Uh, bring to your attention is during the last uh, during this last or current fiscal year sometime in 2019 uh, the Iowa legislature began a serious push to try to limit property tax increase to a 2% guideline each year and so in regards to that um, we have a new uh, a new process that we have to do um, I sent this out today. This is the notice of public hearing on the maximum pro uh, property tax levy. Um, what we'll need to do um, sometime within about the next week is 
or the next by the end of the week versus next week. I'll need to send the final completed one to the press citizen, and that would be for a public hearing in sometime during the first week of March. Right, I put that in my mayor's report. You probably saw that. Should be either be March third, fourth, or fifth to meet the publication uh, deadlines. Mm -hmm. So what we'll do at that meeting is it'll basically be a um, a resolution to approve the maximum levy. Then once that's approved, then I can f actually finish the state budget file. They've put this extra step in this year. A um, couple other additional changes. Um, so what we'll need to do is after this is approved in the first week of March, then the, bu the public hearing notice for the budget will be sent to the press citizen. And then sometime during the last full week of March will be the public hearing to appro uh, approve the budget for fiscal 21. Uh, this whole process didn't really get completed until about January 27th when the Iowa Department of Management actually sent out the updated budget file. So cities across the state are playing catch up to get this in compliance. Uh, what the state also did was they changed the date of the uh, approval and submission of the budget to the county auditor from March 15th to March 31st. That is a permanent change. So what we used to do in the past was, like at this meeting in February, we would just discuss the budget and come up with basically the final numbers. We'd have the notice of public hearing for the budget published and then like the meeting in March would be the approval. Now we have this extra forum and about two extra meetings. So um, just one thing to keep in mind, we may have to next year take a look at uh, what dates we want to do these hearings and stuff. We're playing catch up here, so we're trying to get everything fitted in in about 60 days, both to meet the publication rules and um, public hearing uh, rules. So anyway, that's the long and short of that change. Uh, that 2%, the 2% is not a mandatory amount, but it, it's highly recommended under the assumption that if there's no significant changes of any sort during the year, the budget shouldn't, or the property taxes should not go up any more than 2%. Um, I've seen other publications from other cities lately that are uh, publishing the, the levy notice. Uh, Johnson County was in the paper the other day. Uh, let's see, there were I saw in the Gazette there were a few up around Cedar Rapids. Uh, most of those communities are all exceeding the two percent. In order to exceed the two percent, the city or the county or whatever basically needs to have a justification as to why the property tax went up more than 2%. Well, obviously, if a city's rapidly growing and the tax base is increasing, you know, there's no way we can stay within a 2% guideline there. But you're allowed to justify the increase based on, like, say, the increase in the total taxable value and so forth. It's, it's all circumstantial. Um, some of the increases that I've seen have been uh, pay raises, health insurance, premium, containment issues, and so forth. Um, so that seems to be one, you know, the major things. I believe Johnson County was increasing the levy some to uh, allow for the uh, access center. And so it's, we can exceed the 2% providing we have valid valid reason for it. Um, so what I have in this public or the discussion copy of the publication for the levy um, in the section right below the big schedule here 
explanation of significant you got to get the microphone more in, in front of you. When you turn your head, could you okay. turn the microphone too? Because okay. I know it's real close, but it's not as loud. Okay. Thank you. Is that better there? Yeah, it is. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, so in the explanation, we say the city is hiring additional employees for the p uh, police and building inspection departments. Health insurance premiums continue to increase significantly. What I probably will add once I get um, on the adoption of the budget, we have it'll have the final levy amounts. Uh, right now, the preliminary numbers show that all of the levies, except for the employee benefits, are practically the same as the year before. So as long as the city's not increasing other levies, but we have to increase the levy for employee benefits and payroll taxes just due to more staffing, that would be an adequate reason. So, so anyway, um, this will be finalized shortly and submitted to the press citizen. Um, I don't think I really have any other changes to this issue. Okay, moving on to the 10-page budget worksheet. Um, tonight, I, I'm going to basically go over a lot of the more significant sections here we still have a little bit more work to do on filling in some items and finalizing things so I'm basically going to go over the general items the bigger planning events and so forth um, some comments about some new things here so starting on page one this is the revenues uh, the first section is the property taxes um, that's expected to increase maybe about 40, 35,000 or something like that for the year. Um, okay, going down to the next section, other city taxes, the hotel motel tax. Um, that will start uh, when the hotel opens up this fall, I believe projected date is what the first football game or september 1st sometime We're right around for there september 1st yeah um so the hotel will collect the seven percent hotel motel tax and each month they submit that money to the state that money is a full pass through to the city so whatever the hotel cl collects will come back to the city the state does not take out any administrative portion for that um Given the timeline for this next year, um, because there's always about a two-month lag from the time that the hotel pays the money and the state pays it back to the city, we're looking at about eight months of collections this next year. Um, based on information for potential uh, room, whatever they call it, room occupancy rate, uh, I believe was running at like 75, 75 to 80 percent overall. Uh, they've been predicting a pretty substantial amount of revenue, and if those numbers actually are valid, we could probably be looking at uh, well, it'd be about thirty-two thousand dollars a month. So probably somewhere in the range of about four hundred thousand dollars a year that the city would collect on the hotel motel tax. So that. That's split into two 50% amounts. 50% of it has to be spent on uh, tourism, community attraction purposes, basically to get the public to come and visit our city. Uh, the other half is subjective to the city, me uh, city needs. So that's why I have 256000 split into the two $128,000 numbers there. Uh, there is, further down in the expenses, I did an offset for the expenditures. Um, that's just to show that we'll, at some point in time we'll be spending that money. Uh, there's there's going to be a time lag um, city's obviously going to collect a lot of the tax up front until the expenditures start. So, um, 
anyway what we'll do what we'll do on the books is we'll actually have a, a new fund created for the hotel motel tax that we can actually keep track cumulatively what's been collected and what's been spent and i'll work with Lori on that and help her get that set up on the general ledger so we can so she's got that so can um, I ask, do, you, do you want us to wait until Steve is done before we ask questions or ask questions uh, during his presentation? If it's on this page? Yeah. If it's on this page, you can ask a question. S so uh, uh, of an occupancy at 75%, did that, was that the developer's estimate or was that our estimate? And where did that come from? Um, it's the developer's estimate for right. performance. Yeah. Okay, so they, they're expect, I mean, developers tend to be, they take the best year they've ever had and project it endlessly into the future. Mm -hmm. And that seems to be optimistic to me when the market uh, right now is like 50% occupancy. So I would suggest that, uh, you know, maybe we go about 60% and well, a little more conservative. The performa is, is for the investors and the banker and they're, yeah, and, and it's know. it's based on what the appraiser said, and and uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. I I think we could be a little, I think it's little a bit more conservative number. Though. I think it is a conservative. At seventy five percent, that's a hell of a lot better than the rest of the market, though. And at sixty percent, that's a conservative, reasonable number. I think. I mean, I've well, I've appraised a lot of hotels. I think we should use this number because I, I, I think disagree. it will be better. I, yeah, it that. looks good, but I think that uh, I disagree. That's that's my comment. I see. Yeah, and that that's why I put the offsetting expense against the income here, so we're not creating a too rosy of a situation that more money is going to come in. So if if we did adjust this to say sixty percent occupancy, these revenue numbers would be lower, but then my offsetting expenses would be lower also. So we just have to do that. Th those funds are basically on a zero sum game, you know. You collect it and you spend it. So, um, let's see. A lot of the other revenues are pretty pretty similar, like road use tax, uh, rental permits, building permits, and so forth. Um, going on to page two, uh, special assessments, sixty-eight thousand. Uh, that could be more or less, but we do have. We do have some accumulated special assessments. Um, that money is used to uh, pay for the, uh, I believe it's the, I believe it's the Swisher track bond. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong on that. No, no, it's the special assessments on the resident. Yeah. On, on. So, um, other, other revenues. Uh, this part, for the rest of the page and then to the top of the third page, uh, these are these are going to be the significant capital projects we have coming up. Um, I've tried to I've tried to color code these uh, revenues and expenses so we know exa so you know which items pertain to which project. And then I've also got a you see a little red number off to the side there one two or three. I tried to use that also so you can kind of follow that so for instance the olive court project coming up this spring and over the summer um city of iowa city and developer contributions are going to be right at about one hundred and fifty-five thousand. um going down to the last section that total project now is supposed to have a projected cost of a little over five hundred thousand um, keep in mind the city uh, at the end of fiscal 2019 um, got not quite two hundred and fifty thousand dollars from the lot sales which uh, has been committed to the Olive Court project so when we use that two hundred and fifty thousand the developer contribution then on the other financing sources there um, on the first entry there bond Financing proceeds in the yellow shaded number, right around a hundred thousand. That's the, that would be an amount that would have to be bonded, or some other financing source if it would be available. So we need about a hundred thousand for that project. Uh, the next one is in the blue, uh, blue coated. Um, 
that is Golf View Avenue, um, $22,000 contribution towards that. Uh, at the top of page three, that total project cost is supposed to be about 119000 and that leaves a potential $97,000 that would need bond, bond or other funding for that project. Um, then the third line there, funding needed for other capital projects, 695000 That's the total on the top of page three in the capital projects. We have several street projects there, um, curb ramps, sidewalks, asphalt overlay, and so forth. The total of those projects totaled $695,000. Uh, past practice at the city for these large projects is we've had to bond them. So anyway, I have that's what I have 695 to potentially fund those projects. So um, let's see. Going on page three on the expenses. Um, let's see. Uh, the police department. Um, uh, that the costs are gonna expected to be higher. Of course, we've been we've been in a big transition phase for about the last last year, year and a half or so on the police department, and um, no, nothing um, no, nothing really jumped out as really different or anything. A lot of these items like. Uh, gasoline and repairs for the police cars uh, supplies uniforms things like that uh, those budget amounts are just based on like a three to five year trend some years we spend more than that some years we spend less so we're just kind of using average for those uh, there's also several other items throughout the budget you know general office supplies for city hall same thing we we use a lot of trend analysis for these small ones smaller numbers Okay, yeah. Um, let's see, on page five, uh, building inspections. Building inspections, the, that's gonna change from, uh, that's changing from uh, contracted services to employees. So we're actually gonna have some additional costs there for the Social Security, Medicare, and IPERS. Um, page six. Uh, page six uh, in the top section. There's that hotel motel tax expenditures, and that's the same one hundred and twenty-eight thousand dollar numbers that are in the revenue, just shown as an offset. Um, okay, in the middle of the page, community and economic development, uh, the OUP developer rebate. Um, 713,000, that's the actual estimate from, from the Iowa Department of Management on, on uh, how much TIF money is gonna be coming into the city in fiscal 21. Uh, let's see, public works. Public works, we pretty much have engineering, snow removal and so forth. We have some small, smaller street repair projects, panel replacements. Uh, we have other things, street signs, traffic light, electricity, and so forth. A lot of these are somewhat similar. Uh, the repair projects change some from year to year. Um, let's see. On, okay, in the bottom of page nine is the debt service. Um, debt service is going to be about seventeen thousand dollars higher. Um, pretty much what that is is the OUP bond um, portion applied to principal and interest is increasing somewhat on that. But so that's that's the general um, outline of the budget. Um, at the bottom of page nine, actually, we're looking at net surplus or loss. Um, we're showing minus three hundred and sixty thousand dollars. On 
on page 10 is an adjustment schedule for that uh, we've we've actually discussed this issue before um, out of this three hundred and sixty thousand dollar loss um, sixty eight thousand eight hundred and seventy dollars is what the actual debt servicing um, that's that's the uh, that's the Swisher bond principal and interest and that is covered by local option sales tax money for the first three years that money was received uh, ten, somewhere around 10 12 years ago um, it, it was a substantial amount of money it was a little over five hundred thousand uh, dollars the city has spent some of that we had two major sidewalk wide sidewalk projects uh, somewhere around 170,000 was used for the city match for those projects, and so we have about a little over 300,000 of the local option sales tax money that has not been spent. So, so we're going to use 68,000 out of the cash on hand to fund that debt servicing, um, and then the last item. Uh, the fiscal 19 proceeds, this was for the proceeds from the Olive Court lots. It's actually, it's still in the bank, and that's going to be used to, for the project completion. So, so this number that says loss, you know, when we look at this big loss number, that's really not a loss. That's just net cash outflow. Um, we got to remember last year we had, we had quite a surplus last year because we got that big 200 and, fifty thousand dollar check right at the end of the year so it wasn't we weren't expecting that and there were a few other that was factors. the olive court houses yeah right so actually when we adjust for the cash on hand to fund these things what we really we're really about forty five thousand dollars short altogether um so we have about two weeks to try to whittle this down to get this bottom number close to break even close to zero um, so what because with the process with the maximum levy and everything we have a little bit of time yet to figure out the final adjustments so we'll want to try to get these final adjustments done uh, within the next two weeks so when I come back on the first week of March I'll have the a final version of this which will basically be used once once the levy is approved then I can get the budget file publication sent to the newspaper so we'll have a couple of weeks to get this finalized and fill in the blanks we have a few things that have come up since since I printed this uh, some p possible expense or revenue adjustments here um, we may we may be looking at cutting back some of the expenses they may not be necessary this year we could cut trim a little bit um, the city also has um, could possibly be selling some of those oldest police cars so we have some potential to cut this number this forty five thousand dollar loss significantly but we're still going to probably have to do a little bit tweaking on some of these numbers and so that Bobby and I were talking to Troy about that. Troy, could you give an idea of of what the value of the police cars are, or what do you think we can sure. get for them? We have three the sale. We have three old vehicles. Uh, one of them isn't very old, actually, at all. Uh, the vehicle that Chris Lyons entered into a government purchase agreement, or the city did. Uh, it's not a lease. It's actually a government purchase agreement. Our amount that we owe on that is just under $20,000. i have been dealing with Carl's. They're an um, emergency vehicles uh, distributor out of the Des Moines area, and they have a potential buyer in the Des Moines area for that vehicle. So that's going to be pretty much zero sum, even though we should get twenty to 25000 for it. We do owe twenty on it. I see. Uh, so potentially a net of $5,000 there. The other two old patrol vehicles uh, together, they are worth probably about 13000 based on uh, Sylvia had suggested when she was still on council uh, disposing of them through uh, government uh, 
online auction. I worked with Carl's and, and while they were aware of the one that she suggested, they, they were more familiar with another. But based on what current values are on those and what similar vehicles have sold for within the last 30 to 60 days, we're looking at probably $13,000 for those two vehicles. So 13 for our marked patrol units and potentially 5,000 okay. above what we owe on the third vehicle. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So 18. And then uh, Bobby and I have been looking through this with Steve Cool, and th I think there's some places that we haven't discussed. Do you want to say anything, Bobby? Microphone. Hello? Uh, you know, I mean, we can uh, go back and look through at making cuts. Yeah, I don't know that there's anything else I really have to add. I mean, like Steve said, in the next couple of weeks, we got to try to trim it down a little bit. So we got to figure out where that comes from. I'm confused. Um, it, did I read this right, uh, Steve, that we've got a half a million dollars in our sweep account? More no, that. there's no specific amount that needs to be any bank in any bank. No, I'm know. just asking if it, we've got that much in there. Yeah, now. like for the cash reserve and yeah. so forth. Yeah, and uh, we've got another five hundred thousand in uh, CDs coming due by the end of April. So I mean, you know, they, uh, we've they, got they have to, they have to be prudently invested according to the language on that that. So. Or retain. Or use for the the citizens of University Heights. I mean, either, you know, spend on amenities or reduce taxes or something like that. Yeah. Correct. So yeah. we've got a million dollars coming in by the end of April, and we're talking about finding other ways to trim the budget. And we we owe like 10% of our bonding capacity. And see, in uh, Iowa City, it's at 30%. And I don't want to hold... Coralville is an example, but they're at ninety percent. I mean, this is. It sounds to me like we're doing pretty well. Oh yeah. Okay. And most most cities I've seen, but aren't aren't as low as ten percent. Yeah. Or you know, but, larger or have as much cash on hand as as we've got on hand. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it, so there has it to be responsible to you know let mm -hmm. that cash continue to build up. Either we could pay off some bonding or or whatnot, but. I'm not worried about forty-eight thousand dollars, you know, being in the hole when we've got that much cash sitting around, right? Right. As as long as as long as there's the available funds, because right now um, I don't remember what the total was. The city currently has like one point three yeah, million. I think or it was something. one point three. Yeah. I think it was one point three, one point two, or one point three. Yeah. So anyway, uh, the Iowa League of Cities recommends that for a cash reserve that that be equal to three months or 25 percent of the annual budget so so our our annual our, our monthly expenses are about fifty thousand bucks a month didn't well we, didn't we the, figure that, that? Uh, on on page two on the worksheet here the total revenue before the bond proceeds, there's $2.4 million. Yeah. And so but, for a cash reserve, the city should dedicate or, you know, signify that 25% of that number is the cash reserve. Okay. So, so 600000 600, would be the cash reserve. We, yeah. And we still got 400000 over that. Right. But you have, but also there's 300000 of local option sales tax money that's still in, in the bank account. Is that... <laughs> And then there's also the two hundred and about the two hundred and fifty six or two hundred and fifty thousand from the lots. So so what I'm driving at here is, is that we've money. had a mindset of watching our pennies very closely and we want to continue to exercise that probity, but at the same time, we're in pretty good shape. Well, I yeah. mean, you know, mm -hmm. for, for most small cities, uh we're looking pretty darn good. Yeah. Isn't that right? Oh yeah. And I mean you know. For for what for the challenges that we have, you know, limited sources of revenue to pay for additional things. Yeah, we do we do okay quite well on it. So so anyway, out of 
out of the total cash, say it's 1.3 million, when we take our cash reserve plus the local option money and the bond money or the lot money, that's like 1.1 million. So we really only have about 200,000 left over that's available for unrestricted use. About half of that is in the road use tax fund. So we do have about 100,000 left over that we could fund a deficit year. Okay. What we don't want to do is put the fund in a net deficit. I get it. Position. So I get it. And right. You know, my my thinking is reserves are usually a function of expenses, and if expenses are running fifty thousand dollars a month, then one way of looking at it is a reserve would be three times that, or one hundred and fifty thousand dollars instead of six hundred thousand dollars. So if it's somewhere in between that. I feel pretty comfortable, I guess. You know, I, I don't think it has to be $600,000. And I think we ought to have a line that, that shows uh, reserves. Yeah. And you know? that 25% that figure from the Iowa League of Cities is just a general recommendation. Some cities, some cities have other challenges than other cities. Some have less. So um, I, I've seen cash reserves generally like between two and four months, just depending it, it's all circumstantial, partly, to determine that. Yeah, so. and Steve, help remind me of the history of the year we lived through the state freeze legislation. Uh, how many years ago was that? And if we didn't have reserves, we would have been in deep trouble. And I always you realize I'm not, remember I'm that. Not so, Steve, that. you know, do you remember a little more? Yeah, yeah there was a... There was a time, it was quite a while back, but what happened was the, the legislature just, just froze uh, um, a city's ability to raise property taxes. The, the University Heights City Council had historically been you know, pretty prudent, but didn't have a lot of reserves on hand um, because you know, they, didn't, they didn't see a reason to you know, generate tax just to save it. But then they had some expenditures coming up and they were sort of the victim of their historical um, prudence you might say because they, they needed money uh, their tax rate was really low and uh, they couldn't increase it for I think it was four years we can't hear you yeah. they didn't it, Steve just said they didn't increase it for four years that freeze was on for four years I think it was okay. yeah it was a tough time and if we remember that it's like so we I should like have four years well they suggest 25 percent but we we always have been more conservative than that. I know. We're at 10%. That's pretty conservative. <coughs> Considering that interest rates are at 100-year lows, there might be something that we could uh, do with that money, maybe accelerate some of the road projects or something. But, but I, I, I just object to us feeling like we're living like refugees all the time. I don't think that's the case. Well, those are your words, not mine. That's right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. They're on the record. Uh, so, uh, anyway, we're gonna we need to work on this almost forty five thousand, and then talk, you know, and maybe minus the eighteen thousand from possible car sales, fifteen to eighteen thousand maybe, and uh, work on that in the next couple weeks. And the other thing we need to do is set this these March dates. And while Steve cools here, we need to set. Um, either March 3rd, March 4th, or March 5th for the public hearing for this maximum um, levy, property levy tax. And um, we can, we can uh, adjust the time, but we can, you know, say seven. I see this as maybe no longer than a 30-minute meeting, possibly less. And um, so March 3rd, 4th, and 5th, that's, uh, is it Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday? Um, I know that works for Bobby. Yeah, that's good. And it works for me. They work for you? Great. Yeah, yes for Lisa. And I know, and how about you, Doug? I think I'm available all three days, yes. And... Steve, Chris, you're good. And uh, Casey, we're kind of looking at the third just because it's a Tuesday. That's fine. I mean, is it is going to be at 7 o'clock? 
I've got a commitment at five o'clock up St. Luke's. So okay, so seven o'clock is good. That'd be good. Okay, seven o'clock on March third. Okay. Tuesday, March third. And then while we're doing this, we might as well look at the March twenty fourth, twenty fifth, and twenty sixth. And this is to uh, have a public hearing on our regular FY twenty one budget. And I think that's Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday again. Is that right, Lisa? Mm -hmm. I I'm sorry. I I okay. looked, and then I flew out of my. It's Tuesday, Wednesday. Yeah, that's correct. Tuesday. Yeah. Great. It is. So, can we do Tuesday the twenty fourth again, so we have some consistency? Okay. Yes. Yes. Yes, Casey. You bet. Okay, it's not a women's game, is it? <laughs> I know you're a season ticket holder. That so we're going to do the twenty fourth okay. at seven p.m. Unless somebody wants the time different. Um, so good, we got those dates set. So we'll continue to work on this and. Yeah, just let me know as soon as possible, then, so I can get this to the press citizen and uh we'll, we'll need for the march 3rd meeting we'll need a resolution to approve the maximum profit property tax levy okay it'd be uh, a basic resolution same as to approve like the annual financial report and so forth now uh also uh josiah has these uh street projects you know the different street projects and we also have an agenda item that the council's continuing discussion uh, with these Paul Moore related issues uh, uh, that we talked about last month and uh, uh, Steve and Josiah do you I know you've met and do you want to talk about that maybe start with Josiah maybe because um, uh, Josiah, you finalized those figures, and uh, I want to know in the s projects that you have listed, which ones you, if you recommend one and why, or overall, not just with the yeah, overall too. Oh. We need to okay. Well, we started with Paul, so we heard from Paul last month, and. Um, as directed by the council, we followed up with him and looked into like some concepts, what we were talking about. And as I noted in my um, report, uh, the written report, there's a there's a line item in there for project costs for Golfview Avenue. And as I describe here, um, it sort of addresses the the highlights of the things that Paul was talking about, which was uh, one, the ADA parking, um, and I guess. And two, the drainage, the drainage issues that he's seen up there on Golfview Avenue over the years. Thank you. So I think up on the screen here is sort of the schematic I sent out uh, to everybody, um, showing how that concept laid out. And you can see there at the bottom of the screen, those are the two uh, parking stalls nearest Paul's building that we had been talked about and converting those into ADA stalls. And if, and if you recall from that discussion last month, and I pointed out this, this item goes back to uh, the fact that when the Melrose Streetscape project occurs, the parking on Melrose on the street out in front of Paul's building will go away, and there's, the city has one ADA parking stall there. So the discussion had been for a, for a number of years is you know planning to replace that and where would it go and how would that happen? So um, again, this is consistent with what we talked about last month. Uh, this would con would provide two ADA stalls there and that's the area that's widened in front of 116, which is the property that Paul owns. Aside from that, the other thing I'm showing here is that uh, in order to address some of the drainage issues that are out there with the flat grades, um, we had talked, we always look at, and I think Paul mentioned maybe adding storm sewer. You know, you have intakes in the streets and then you have pipe. Well, the low points to the top of the sheet there, uh, up where the ravine is that heads um, 
sort of north towards the railroad. That's the low point. So you're going to have to start there with those intakes, uh, basically tear up the entire curb section because you have to put Barry storm pipe in there and then put a series of intakes or one or two or three. So we looked at that. Um, it, it's, there's a cost associated with it. But since that those grades are so flat, and since the uh, stalls are have snow removal, if you if you have snow removal or snow whatever piles up or that intake gets blocked, basically you're back to wh where you were, right? It doesn't matter how much pipe you have in the ground. If the water can't get in, uh, it doesn't work. So um, what we're recommending here and shown highlighted there is actually a, a strip of permeable paver pavers under the parking spaces, which is like a pointed out similar to what you see out here in this parking lot in the back row of parking stalls. <coughs> the cost is comparable and even and even probably a little bit ahead of all the storm pipe and excavation and intakes. But primarily the fact is that whole entire area is now available for water to drain in. So it doesn't have to hit an intake or anything. Any, as long as that water gets on that, that area, it can drain. So I think that's a benefit. I think that's probably why that's why I'm recommending it I think it's a better solution in this case uh, the, the third thing that I'd mentioned in my report on on this concept was that since we have to tear up that curb and those parking spaces re regardless if you're going to address drainage or anything like that um, I'm suggesting and showing here we're actually moving that curb out two feet the reason why I'm showing that is the existing road there's 29 feet wide and the recommended minimum width for a two-lane street with on-street <coughs> parking is 31 feet to give everybody the appropriate room. Obviously, it's, it's worked the way it is. It, it is tight, but in going through this exercise, if you're going to have to tear it all up anyway, why not um, take a look at doing that as well? Um, so... I guess so. Are there any questions about this? I guess I have a question. Th is there any concern about the um, the, the <coughs> permeable surface and snow removal and you know in longevity that type of thing um, versus a hard surface and storm drains? I I've not I've not heard that concern. I mean, there's been a lot of I mean, there's permeable favorite streets, mm -hmm. obviously, and mm -hmm. full streets and towns and mm -hmm. a lot of parking spaces. So I they've they've held up well. The the uh, materials are good for that sort yeah. of application. That was that was it. Yeah. yeah. Um, so so in that line item, um, all of that work you see there was estimated at like 119, and then obviously Paul had pointed out he'd be willing to contribute to certain components of those things, mostly around the ADA parking, and so it broke out those quantities or costs, and that was around 22,000 for that piece of it. So uh, as you go through your budget consideration and your projects list, that project is this, which is tied to, to Paul's uh, addressing of the council last month. And so uh, do you think, when do you, when would you want it, when would be the best time to do this project? Can it? Wait, what do you think? I mean, because we're going to be doing the Melrose streetscape. Yeah. So can you speak yeah, to that? Thank you. And so that was, the timing was in there as well. And as I pointed out, the Melrose streetscape is probably 2023 construction. So if you want to get this in place before that happens, some, uh, either just the parking stalls or this project overall would need to, need to be in this current round of budget for for next year or the next one so that it, and, I, and I think it makes sense for 21 I think it makes sense to take care of this before the Melrose starts and replace your spot and have it and have an in, in uninterrupted service for your uh, your ADA parking availability so are you saying on the 21 budget is that what you're saying this or one the, we're going through right now yes it should be 2021 20 and 21. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I always have to say both. June 1st, so if, 2020. If you, if you wanted to include it in, in the budget cycle you're going through right now, um, 
it could be designed and constructed in 2021. Or you could push it off to the next cycle and construct it in 2022. And I think both of those would get this done before the Melrose one uh, starts getting torn up. Gotcha. Steve, you wanted you want to d have the council decide on which projects they want to do before before they finalize. Uh, yeah, because before March, correct? Right. Um, because on the on the capital projects, we have in addition to the Golf View Avenue, we have six other ones that we. How we've always done the budget is put the capital projects together as a wish list, and then depending on where we're at, we've started tossing them out, delay them, mm -hmm. you know, for future you bonds. You want to talk about those, so Josiah, forth. quickly? Sure. Okay. Uh, so here's the... Thank you. Here's the map of the different locations of the projects that are listed in there for consideration. Um, number one, Olive Court, that's obviously, that's a construction project. So uh, the second one was number two, was Oakcrest Avenue. And number three, right above that in yellow, was Highland Drive. Um, that's a project to basically rehab those streets. Um, the over, it's a, those are concrete streets with asphalt overlay that have uh, been deteriorating quite a bit over the years. And so, and actually these are back from, from previous budget discussions. So Oakcrest Avenue, basically from sunset down to, down to Kosher, you're gonna replace your asphalt surface similar to what we did on George Street uh, a couple years ago. Um, there's also costs in there to, you have to um, adjust some of the people's driveways that touch the street when you mess with the street, but also to replace the storm sewer intakes. Um, the, the storm sewer intakes there, some of them are, are in pretty bad shape and are starting to affect the street as well. So that project not only overlays the street, but addresses the storm intakes. And uh, all the, the couple of side streets that tie into Oakcrest those are also getting in rough shape where the asphalt's wearing away. So this would basically clean all those intersections up as well. I've got a question, Josiah. Um, we were talking about uh, taking care of the curb at the same time that we um, address the ADA parking on the on the oh, Paul's dear. project. And I'm wondering if um, if we should be doing the sidewalk at the same time as the road because it'll you know, those it'll be less inconvenience for the property owners, I would think, and and it would probably be an, uh, a little bit cheaper that way because the contractor will already be set up. You're talking about number five. Um, uh, the Oakcrest Avenue North. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Is that something that we we gain anything by doing them together? Uh, probably yes. Okay. Yeah. I mean. If anything, as you point out, just from the standpoint of disruption mm -hmm. to residents, you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Yep. Uh, and, uh, and, and usually it, it's a valid point, too, that if you're there and you it's in a bigger project, you'll get a better, better, bid, better maybe. bid unit cost on that work. And rather that's than the one that's 76000 Casey? Yeah, so maybe I should talk about that way. So two is the street, five is the proposed north side sidewalk. That Again, that's sort of comes out of your the city's visioning report on where sidewalks were and what first priority sidewalks were and where they were missing. So that uh, is the estimate. Right above that, number three, Highland Drive, that's similar to, to Oakcrest, um, replacing the asphalt overlay through there, uh, some of the driveway aprons and trying to address some drainage issues um, that have been there for a long time on the north curb. And I, I've got another question for you. Those bus stops on uh, Melrose Avenue, would I, I was trying to 
uh, I was coming up Melrose this morning at about quarter to eight, and the traffic was backed up all the way to the second entrance to Finkbine Golf Course. And I'm wondering if those bus stops would take any uh, of the traffic off that or relieve some of the traffic. Do you have any opinion on that? Yeah, no. That's what I figured. Oh. Okay, thank you. So we'll just I'll just keep going up the up the sheet there. So the number eight, the Melrose bus stop. So those paved landings are not like a bus pull off like you see, but actually just where they let people out. They're they're letting them out into like the grass or the curb or um, so it, it would provide a I guess a proper paved landing for people to be dropped off at. So would any of that be affected by the Melrose street scheme? You did something like that in advance. Yeah, so there, there's two there's two down there uh, near the triangle shown, um, but really the the distance between those sidewalks and the street there is just a couple feet. So it's it's basically just a matter of putting in you know four or five sidewalk panels there. So yes, technically if you put them in, they'd have to be redone, but it's pretty minor. Um, so. Did you rank these? I mean, which what do you recommend, you know? What do you think? I mean, I know you think that probably before Melrose that uh, golf view needs to be done. I, I think that's a good idea, a good plan. Yeah. So that's one of the next two years. Uh, I, I think that uh, taking care of Oakrest uh, would probably be my first priority, and then Highland. Um, now I know I know those are bigger numbers, so you mean the Oakcrest Street? You can't do both of the street projects at the same time. I'd probably lean right. towards Oakcrest if we could, because that's a long stretch and it's highly traveled. And um, I guess that'd bring in the consideration that you brought up of, you know, do we do the sidewalk at the same time? If that's what you want to do. And then and then after that, I think I think the rest of them, you know, there's a couple like the bus landings could be done fairly easily. And uh, again, there's the ADA curb ramp projects on, on Sunset. But again, you're not on a timeline to get those done. So um, if you want, if you needed to delay those, that'd be fine as well. Probably be a good idea to do uh, Oakcrest and then schools out. Correct, yep. Um, so we have 100,000 uh, for the uh, to do the Olive Court, which which still ha the city has to cover, and then the city would cover ninety seven thousand of Golf View, right? That's the estimate. Yep. So that could be two potential, and then uh, to bond for possibly, and then um, if you add others to that. Um, um, you're talking, well, Oakcrest Avenue is 339000 and the sidewalk is seventy five. That's like a project by itself, pretty much. It's a big project. That's a really big project. Um, Well, if it costs us fifteen thousand dollars more if we do them separately than if we do them together, it may be worth the money. Well, and I mean, you know, you put them down the years too; the prices go up. I mean, there's always that. Yeah. You know, in I all agree. our projects, prices go up every year. We delay it, but um, that's. You know, I mean, we could add in, I mean, the bus landings are 11500 Right, Josiah? And those are the ones that are on yeah, those Sunset and close to... Yeah. Right. Right. And I know, again, I have to look at this chart. Again, depending on where we get down to, we could do two of them, you know, and not all six or, you know. So um, Sorry. we have to do the 100000 for Olive Court. Mm -hmm. And um, you're suggesting 
uh, the 97,000 for Golfview to be done in maybe now. And then um, uh, maybe the bus stop landings. What did you put? Okay, you got sunset. Okay, you got curb ramps. You got more curb ramps. Um, well, I mean, a good project this year is the is like two hundred plus thousand. Yeah. You know what do you think, Lisa? I mean, this, this, the hundred thousand, the ninety-seven thousand, the the bus stops makes it about a little over 200,000. Josiah, are we, uh, and then we can make these other projects down the road, down the road you know, like 22, 23. I don't know. You like that, Lisa? I do. Uh, the Olive Court and the Golf View. And the bus stop landings. I have a question. No questions. And um, so we could we could do that mm -hmm. for this the year's bus, projects, bus, bus which would make it just a little over two hundred thousand. You know, I, I'd be for that if we could do the. Uh, Oakcrest projects, as long as we did them together, I'd be fine with it. Uh, oh, you mean the sidewalk and the street? Yeah. We'll push them all to the following year. Yeah. Because yeah. that's, uh, yeah, and you said you'd get a better price maybe because that's over 400000 yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I, that's a lot of adding. Okay, so let's, let's uh, work that in to this budget. Is that okay with you, Doug and Sarah? Oakcrest. To lay Oakcrest and Highland. And the curb ramps. We were going to delay those right now. Yeah. Well, curb ramps. Sure. Golf View Avenue, the bus stop lane, the and obviously the Olive Court. Yeah. Okay. So we'll look into that. Uh, is that good with you, Josiah? Yeah. Okay. And uh, so we'll go. I'm not taking any questions. You can talk afterwards. And so. So um, we'll, we'll put those projects. So uh, now. Paul, so we're addressing your issue on on the 21 budget. So between June, uh, July 1st, and uh, June 30th of next year, we'll address that. Okay. Yeah, you can because you're on the agenda. And that's why I wanted to check with you. Paul Moore, 1,000, 1,006 Melrose, and 116 Golf You. I want to thank the council and Steve Ballard and Josiah for all the work and consideration on this project. I'm not trying to push this through, but I'm trying to get it done ahead of the Melrose Avenue beautification project because it really affects my tenants and my commercial business district. We're losing the unloading zone on Melrose Avenue, plus the parking and the place for the bionic bus unloads and things like that. I'm getting to the age I don't need this handicapped parking space, but it might not be too many more years. And I'm trying to look out for the public safety and the elderly people that patronize Stella's and the dentist's office. And so I'm not pushing this, and whenever it fits in 
the budget time-wise, if we can get it ahead of Melrose Avenue, I'm in favor of it. I'm delighted with the work that Josiah has done. Widening the street is a really a good idea. Addressing sidewalks and drive approaches, it all interconnects. And so when you start tearing things up, just to, well, upgrade everything, put it behind us. Depending on the, the system, there's bonuses and negative things with everything. But the overall picture, we got to realize that typically, for years, we've had the fire department, the ambulance, and a Gator emergency vehicle park in front of 116 Gulfview. I cannot think of any other place where they have access to go four or five different directions out of that intersection. So I think that's very important for football games. We've got newer signs that were put up, no parking on football game day. I expect to honor that the same way with handicap. If you're starting to put handicap parking spaces all over University Heights, you're going to have a heck of a job. And so let the university and the athletic department address that problem. But I, as I say, I'm very much in favor of what drawings have come up in preliminary. I'm willing to pay the 22000 or 25000 it's to the benefit of my family and the business district. So thank you for my consider to your consideration. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Steve, you didn't have anything to add with that. Okay, so Steve, uh, we'll get back to you too, and we have some projects that we want to do, the council wants to do. And so... Um, Bobby and I will get back to you in the next you know, couple weeks, like, and work on uh, yeah. the monies. Yep, that'd be fine. Any other questions that you have? For nope, the, I don't have anything else. Okay, so. great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, okay, I submitted my written mayor's report, and uh, we have Jim Glasgow here tonight for the hotel project update. And I know Jim's got a... Uh, some pictures for us tonight thank you Jim yep well the pictures the pictures that you're going to look at were taken today so uh, this first one shows uh, the view this is on the railroad track side and you're looking at four stories so we're, we're on fourth we're on fourth floor right now and the ceiling of fourth is actually the floor of fifth so uh, we'll be up on fifth floor probably within a week or two and that's the last floor of the hotel, and then on top of that is is the uh, restaurant. Uh, this picture just shows you what uh, our retaining walls and the fencing on top. Almost all of our retaining walls are done, and, and most of the fencing is done now too. So, and that pretty much wraps the whole perimeter of the hotel, both on the railroad track side and and then along the western, uh, well, what I call the western border, the Olive Court side. We've got a, a small retaining wall there that 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 uh, abuts the green space on that side, and and that that sidewalk that that was there is that sidewalk right there is the seven foot sidewalk that goes all the way out to Melrose, and it comes from uh, kind of down where the red brick condominiums are. There's a set of stairs there, and then this this one will go all along the railroad tracks all the way out to Melrose. That is looking, that, that's a view looking at our garage entrance. So there's 30 spots underneath, underneath the hotel that are actually inside the building. And then, um, so this kind of dips down and you'll have a, an entrance going in and then the smaller entrance is, is the exit coming out of the parking area. Now we do have, at this point, we have power into the building. That transformer right there is, is uh, energized so we we have full power into the building now and uh, that's that was a fair, fairly major step to get us to that point this is looking at 
the olive court side and again you'll see the four stories where the yellow the yellow uh, on the bottom is actually the uh, gymnasium area or the workout area looking out over the the patio area to the to the west and there there's another shot of that same side now this is the this is inside the building this is the entrance when you walk in through the the main entrance of the building there's a two-story uh, atrium in there so there will be a balcony from the second floor kind of overlooking overlooking the first floor this would actually be the the lower restaurant area and the lobby area now this is up on second floor and this will just show you some of the steel framing uh, the the whole building above the first two floors is going to be all steel construction like this. This is these are really heavy duty. Uh, it's it's structural steel framing. So all, all the the next uh, four floors will will all be this this type of construction. Now the only reason I took this picture this is actually on fourth floor, and you can see the the Hawkeye emblem in the back. So. That's the that is the view from the the corner, uh, looking over at the stadium. So that's up on fourth floor. And this is this is fourth floor again, just looking down the hallway. So we we actually have the part of fifth floor is started. If you look, the the top of that is actually the fifth floor. And then that's the that's that's the view from kind of looking at from the Melrose Bridge, looking down at the kind of the, the uh, it'd be the restaurant area and and shows shows we're up on fourth floor so right now we're we're pretty happy with the way it's going the guys are working 10 12 hours a day and we're trying to we're trying to get this all under roof within the next month or two so and the only thing I'd like to agree with Casey though <laughs> I I hope you be more conservative at least the first year when you budget things because it, it does take a while to gear up and get out of the chute here and and uh, I think I think this hotel is going to be the top dog in the in the whole area but we have a lot of competition now there's four or five new hotels opening up in downtown Iowa City and Stay Ridge is going up in Coralville which is another hundred unit hotel so there's a lot of competition out there but we're going to be aggressive, and we're going to be talking to the, everybody over at the university, and we've got the sports and the uh, pharmacy and, and everybody everybody over there, and we'll get them on board. But uh, sometimes it does take a, a year to really gear up and, and get, get us up to where we want to be. So other than that, uh, if the weather holds up, we'll, we'll be moving right along, I think. so. We're still on for September 1. That's your goal. Well, let, ask, I'll, I'll answer that question when we get the roof on. Okay. <laughs> that'll that'll give us a lot lot better idea where we're really are yeah. on schedule. So, but it, it's I know it's going pretty good. We're a few weeks behind where we thought we were going to be, but it's we've had a lot of ice and snow, so it's been been a little tough. But um, thank you. Okay. Is there any questions for Jim? No. Thank you so yeah. much for thank bringing you. all the yep. photos. Um, we'll go on to uh, Steve Smith is here from Johnson County Refuse and he's been our contractor for uh, 26 years 1994 when I first came on council um, I rode in your truck to to look at what you did do you remember that S yeah, Steve like how many council members out. wrote in your tr I mean I wrote in like four different she come out and wrote in when I was picking up the city of Tiffin and we bounced back and forth from truck to truck she's the only one yeah that done and then so. anyway it was recommended then that year that we go with Johnson County refuse my very first year we were both real young we both yeah I was. <laughs> Both young and new to, to what we was doing. So, yeah, anyways, my but name anyway. is Steve Smith, Johnson County Refuse. Um, Louise asked me to come tonight just to, to introduce myself and maybe talk about what we're what we're doing and what we've been doing. I guess so. Um, probably the the biggest thing to talk about is in, in, from my side is that for 25 of the 26 years we had the same system. And last year, obviously, you guys all know you got the carts. Um, hopefully, everybody likes them. Um, that was a, a big. A real big change for us and we're 
doing it throughout all the cities we do. Um, seems to be working working pretty good so far. Um, I don't think we've had any any real problems with them. Uh, for us starting out uh, almost about a year and a half ago, and never really doing the cart systems before that. So, and I think the people people for the most part everywhere has really really liked them compared to the what we was doing before with the small containers and being able to throw the recycling all together and stuff. So, I think we've had um, the least complaints about something new with this cart system. I, I mean, and we've and and we've helped work some people through and some of them had to get smaller wanted smaller carts mm -hmm. and you worked very well with us doing that. Just a few. And I think some of that is is that too is that people that are, that are moving from other areas, you know, they're they're used to them cart the carts um, uh, from some places and we we get a lot of flack from the people coming into our areas and and having to buy tags and use the small bins compared to what they what they was used to. And I think it was just getting the regular people that hadn't used them systems uh, to to be able to start using them. So, but I think it's went pretty good. Um, if anybody's got any questions, we also our compost program that we started several years ago. That's probably a place where we could probably use to um, to if we need to promote anything is is get the composting going a little better. We have about 50 carts, our uh, residents that have compost carts, but we probably, they don't, don't, nobody really, a few people will put them out every week and then a few are, are every couple weeks or three weeks or something like that, depending on how, how um, you know, how, how they fill. But that's probably an area if we wanted to look at expanding something we're doing is, is to get more people composting. So. And uh, one of the things I'd like to talk about is cleanup day, because that'll be coming up in April. Mm -hmm. And uh, you usually, you have to work us in with your other dates. Yeah, it's usually been um, either the, the second to the last Saturday in April or the last Saturday in April. Right, um, I think second to the last yeah. is usually well, I think like the 20, 19, 20, 21. Yeah, I think we can, we can go either probably either one of those and, and what's happened there is we've pretty much just supplied oh. containers for it and and you guys have um had yeah we have volunteers that, that have helped unload and load things um i think it's usually went from and, eight to and one or something like i that. think last year we had drop off times for from we've kind of done different things we used to do like eight to noon and i think we've kind of made it nine to eleven and the last pickup you come is after 11 yeah and i think we've usually had two roll-offs down there for the most part sometimes and what we yeah. do is we have them on marietta in case you forget you know because it's the parking area of marietta the city parking area of marietta okay. and uh, so we can have either of those weekends either one of those we we should be able to be able to work with so okay and so so for the most part i think you guys have had a council person to take lead on it and 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 basically work with me with a phone number on when the containers need to be dumped if they need to right. be dumped and to try to get the containers in right before you start and get them out as soon as we can. Well, I already have a volunteer so. that wants to help. Good. So that's good. I'll see which weekend works best for her <laughs> too, and then we'll talk some more. And uh, I, uh, Lisa and I were talking about maybe we could have like a recycling composting workshop maybe we, set up we i don't know that, the, we did that the um first year we had we had stuff set up for composting the first year we did compost and right i believe at the cleanup we just we had some stuff set up which we could do oh that. at the cleanup that's right <clears throat> and then i think you were at one of our uh events one year too uh, I don't know. You know what I mean? I think like, there was there was one. I mean, a long time ago. When we first started it. Yeah, when we first started. But I don't know. I'll, we'll see if there's interest in that. Okay. You know, because... Uh, if nothing else, uh, I think we still have the stuff, that, the literature and things that we set up oh. to clean up that time. I think we still okay, so we could put some of that literature out. Mm -hmm. yeah. So... I don't know. I always have to talk to my husband. I this is one job I give to him, and <laughs> I I can't get you know when there's something wrong and it's back in there. I say no. I said no plastic lids. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so that'd be good to get a sheet again of that. But you do put things on your carts now too. Yeah, the lids, the lids for which is very helpful. Is what's recyclable, and and one of the things that probably one of our biggest, biggest problems with the carts is is we're is the um, contamination. It's not real bad, but it's getting people to look and read the read the top of the the lid. Um, uh, is we didn't. The only thing we really changed in recycling is we didn't add anything to recycling. We just changed how we how you guys put it out to the curb in the container and how we pick it up. There was nothing. You know, our biggest thing is people plastic bags are a big oh, no no, right. and it's but it's 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 everywhere. And we knew we was going to have a little bit of a problem with that, and it's just working. It was just working through it. Where before, when we was doing the small bins, we could just pull that stuff, leave it. And now it's just a little harder once it dumps in the truck. So, right. And so the biggest thing is not to have the plastic bags. That's the biggest thing we see. Okay. Well, cycle. that's and good to point be, out to our audience. So. Right. Okay. okay. Uh, any questions for Steve? Well, can you? I, we have a compost bin, but I forget how we got it. <laughs> so can you just review? If yeah. Somebody wants if somebody wants one, bin, how they, do that? they just contact us at the at the office, and we those. We supply the, the garbage and recycle, but the compost, we have a $25 deposit on it, and they can pay the deposit through the through on a credit card over the, the phone, and then we use then we will get the compost card out within a couple days usually, um, unless I forget, and it's a little bit longer, but and we'll usually give information there for composting with that and a couple free the free bags. So they do have to use our yard waste bag in the cart, and that's how, the, how they pay for it. So it's real, real easy to get set up. Good question. Anything else? So, thank you for coming yep, so much, yep. and and uh, we'll get back to you on that date because okay. you'll need to know yeah, either, pretty either soon. One of those dates are fine. We got plenty of time. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Steve. Uh, then uh, we'll go to the legal report, and Steve, you want to start this? Sure. Um, as I covered in the written report, uh, after the meeting in January, we, there were some discussions about whether with some of the expanded responsibilities that Terry Gert was undertaking, going from being the city's building and code official related to building uh, items, also then taking on housing enforcement, and then Brian coming on and sort of just reevaluating their responsibilities and whether they really were independent contractors or part-time employees. And uh, the determination was that they, they really are properly treated as part-time employees. So, so uh, there are two resolutions before the council tonight. Uh, 2004 uh, appoints uh, Terry as part-time employee to perform both housing and building inspection services for the city. And um, so it, in addition to, tr to uh, being clear that he's a part-time employee, it also uh, combines uh, a prior agreement that the city had with, with Terry for, for building services with the present one for housing services, so we're not operating under two agreements. And then 2005 appoints Brian as a part-time employee to uh, conduct uh, housing um, services. So the nature of the services and really the scope of them don't change a whole lot from what the council approved in um, in uh, January, but there are some additional reporting requirements and some things like that. So, so those two resolutions, 2004 and uh, 2005, are before you. Okay. So consideration of resolution number 2004. Is there a motion? Yes, I'll move. Motion by Lisa. Is there a second? Second. Okay, now discussion. Once we have a motion on the table, then can discuss. Was the second Casey? Second was Casey. Thank you. And uh, so no discussion. Uh, roll call vote. Moore? Aye. Scott? Aye. Cook? Aye. O'Sullivan? Aye. Swales? Aye. Carried? Then we have consideration of resolution number 2005 appointing Brian Jensen as part-time employee. Um, is there a motion? Yes. Motion by Lisa. Second. S second by Casey. Uh, discussion. 
Okay, roll call vote. Scott? Aye. Cook? Aye. O'Sullivan? Aye. Swales? Aye. Moore? Aye. Carried? So then I think the next item is the is the uh, ordinance 245 which makes changes to the rental housing code and I tried to summarize summarize those in in uh, my uh, revised report that was sent yesterday um, I guess I don't unless you want me to walk through them I, I, I wasn't planning to I mean I can I just figured you probably read it um, I, I would point out a, a couple of things uh, one is that so the, the, the if if the council adopts this ordinance, whether that's tonight or at any other time, it, the ordinance itself rescinds the the moratorium on rental permits. So if that wasn't clear, I want to be real clear about that. And the only other thing that I guess I wanted to point out, um, the the ordinance makes some changes, obviously that were discussed and recommended at the meeting uh, last Thursday. Um, the parking change. Uh, isn't ch or the parking uh, not is not a change I just I want to point that out so it doesn't mean that people don't have feelings about it or thoughts and that's you know but th that's not a change that's been on the books yeah. for that's changing a couple yeah. Yeah. Right. like there's the reason it came out maybe is because we kind of discussed it but we're not you know the, the changes on the table are not changing right parking. yeah and then and I I trust that you understood this, but you know, there's a, the whole sea of red in the, the document I sent you was just cutting out all the stuff about um, the caps on rental permits. You can see that there was a lot of uh, attention paid to that and a lot of, uh, well, I guess it doesn't show the back and forth, but there was a lot of that. But that's just all gonna be gone and that's the result of the, the legislative action that we've discussed before. And we also have on the books um, for every resident in University Heights about mowing, about, uh, I mean, yeah. Steve, do you wanna? Yeah, the sidewalk, um, the sidewalk, you know, scooping snow and removing ice from sidewalks, that applies to everyone, not just rental properties. The, the same is true for upkeep of lawns. Um, yeah. Trash and recycling cards. Trash and recycling, I mean, what, what uh, Kyle pointed out, part of it's different like the placement times and the removal times from the curb when you that's the same for everybody the rental housing code does say you know to keep trash receptacles not visible from the street that's in front of your home and that and and the and the um that doesn't apply to you know a, a homeowner um, can we make that apply to homeowners you can uh we you know you just need to but we just need to revise that portion of, uh, of a different ordinance you can't do it tonight but oh yeah yeah you can't I mean yeah. you know these are policy considerations and it's always uh, I'm always reluctant to you know I'm not a policy maker I, I think part of the part of the sentiment has been that you know if a person owns his or her house they may have a little different incentive about upkeep than somebody who rents somebody else's home probably not true in all cases um, but I think that's part of what drives the action uh, when when political bodies say, well, we're going to treat owner-occupied um, structures one way and rental structures another way. But anyway, okay. but the answer to your question, Lisa, is yes, you can do that. Thank you, Steve. And could you explain collapsing the vote and when? Mm -hmm. it, because that was part of your report, too. And yeah. You know, the, at the special meeting last Thursday, there were several things that were discussed, but one of them was, you know, like, when can we do this? And um, and I said, I can get something together, but it's not going to be till after the weekend, which it wasn't. But uh, but this is an ordinance, and an ordinance requires three, three votes or three considerations, unless the council says, nope, we're good with everything, and we think there's been, you know, ample discussion, so we want to collapse. So you can collapse either, you know, two votes into one or all three into one, um, or you can take them uh, one at a time. It's just the council's prerogative. You've got um, some special meetings coming up, which you don't always have. So, uh, you know, somebody might say, well, let's let's have the first reading tonight and the second reading on the 3rd of March. And, and then, the, you know, and then Louise says, no, I told them it was going to be a half an hour meeting. And then <laughs> if we start 
because sometimes that happens. We used to schedule a special meeting for a limited purpose, and then that those limits seem to expand. But nonetheless, with those special meetings, you could consider it at different meetings. But if, but based on what I heard the council saying, I just wanted to include that notion. Um, again, it's a, it's the council's prerogative if you want to collapse the three readings of this ordinance tonight and rescind the moratorium and adopt these other things. Uh, you you may do that. And you do the collapsing first. You do the collapsing first. The, the, the collapsing, it, it, it's a little, um, I don't know if it's confusing, but the collapsing takes four votes of the council, and then adopting the ordinance takes three votes. So presumably if four people are voting to collapse it, they're all going to vote to adopt it too, but it doesn't always go that way. So, Are there any questions for Steve? Uh, did we decide to accept uh, Brian's uh, changes to the uh, uh, what you might call it? Pop? So the inner, the the, the uh, property maintenance code. W there, the answer is no. Um, th that's not part of this ordinance. Okay, we can do that later. Yeah, and okay. I've uh, there. So I, we've had some emails, uh, and I can't remember who was on all of them. I can't remember if you were, Casey. I apologize if you weren't. That's but right. there was discussion between uh, Terry, Brian, and, and myself. It sounds like the changes aren't really that significant, and so I guess I have it on my list to ask those guys: Do you want us to like just adopt those other changes, or adopt the whole code, or yeah, do nothing? It sounded like they they just want to give a little bit more time, yeah, because it's a, a big demand. Yeah, but so. we do have, but the but the 2015 version of that code is is in place and has been. Okay. And would you just speak to the audience too about when this starts? When do these uh, changes start you know that's uh, written in the ordinance yeah so uh, when they start uh, it, it depends which uh, which particular uh, change we're talking about uh, quite a few of the changes that that are in the new in the ordinance before the council would only would only apply to new uh, rental permits so there's you know like a minimum a minimum square footage of a backyard if you have a rental permit now, that's not going to apply to you. Okay, you're not going to meet, have to meet a minimum square footage uh, in your backyard. Um, uh, the radon uh, testing uh, would apply for for new permits, but for re renewing permits, it would require it would wouldn't apply until really the summer of 2021. So it seems like there'd be ample time to get testing and mitigation if. Uh, if needed, um, uh, new rental permits would also have the requirement of a hundred square feet of, of uh, common living space for every bedroom. Uh, that would not apply to um, existing permits. I think those are the biggest ones that. Uh, mm -hmm. And then, so then, with regard to other ones, I guess uh, like uh, like. Uh, trash or uh, or placing smoke detectors and so forth those would those would take effect I mean they would the, the, the ordinance takes effect immediately but they really wouldn't take effect until uh, rental permits were actually renewed so you know I, mm -hmm. our, our renew our rental permit term is August 1 to July 31 so they really wouldn't take effect until you know you were applying to renew and you'd, you'd get the thing saying you have to show us a diagram or your smoke detectors are where's your co detector and some things like that so if that answers your question yeah thank you um so uh this is before you council um uh, <coughs> yeah i mean i moved to collapse the readings from three to one that being just tonight so you move to suspend the requirement that a proposed ordinance be considered and voted upon for passage at two council meetings prior to the meeting at which it is to be finally passed you took the words right out of my mouth that's what I think that's what I, I was like come say. on Lisa help me out <laughs> you were doing that. Uh, well, <coughs> and so that's a motion by Casey. Is there a second? I'll second. Second by Bobby. Uh, discussion. 
Uh, roll call. Uh, yeah, you got a discussion. Just, uh, very quick. Just sure. Do it. Um, I don't see any downside to uh, Lisa's concerns about applying it to owner-occupied as well as uh, uh, tenant, I mean, rental properties. So Great. if we can change that at some time, I'd like to. I see. Any other discussion? Okay, roll call vote. Cook? Aye. O'Sullivan? Aye. Swales? Aye. Moore? Aye. Scott? Aye. Carried? Okay, and now we have before you for uh, the consideration of number 45, 245, amending the rental housing code with respect to certain parking, health, and safety issues, <laughs> minimum area requirements, permit application, contents, and related manners. Is there a motion? I'll make motion. motion by Lisa. Sec second by Bobby. Discussion. Roll call vote. O'Sullivan. Aye. Swales. Aye. Moore. Aye. Scott. Aye. Cook. Aye. Carried. Okay, so with that, as Steve said, the moratorium's lifted yeah. today. Yeah, it has to be I mean, published. Tomorrow, yes. published yeah. tomorrow. Yeah. So after publication, mm -hmm. then, then applic so if somebody will ask, when can I apply? Yeah, so if somebody asks that, I would tell them to apply now. It's just okay. it can't be issued until it's published. It'll be published as soon as the press citizen will publish it, which is probably probably Saturday or Monday. Okay. Thank you, Steve. Thank yeah. you, Council. Um, we'll go on to the city clerk report. You all received my report in the updated rental and building spreadsheets, and as we are 10 minutes to 9, I will keep it short and sweet. If you have any questions, see me after the meeting. Okay, any questions for Chris? We'll go on to Lori. Uh, Lori sent her report today with uh, warrants. Are there any additions or corrections uh, uh, for payment of the warrants? Uh, there's no additions or corrections. The warrants will be paid by unanimous consent. Um, streets and sidewalks. Uh, I think we kind of went through that, but Doug, you go ahead. And I really don't have much more to add other than, like say, we uh, had a few residents that uh, had a tough time getting the sidewalks clean in a timely manner, but uh, our new door hangers seem to uh, resolve that issue. and. Uh, the chief has done a really good job of monitoring it and, and following up, and uh, they were resolved quite quickly. So uh, really don't have much else to talk about uh, other than what uh, Josiah and I have talked about and uh, what has been discussed early tonight. So I, I really don't have much more to add. Okay. Any questions for Doug? Okay. Uh, Josiah? Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So we've got uh, consideration of the Olive Court improvements construction project. First one is consideration of resolution 2006, accepting the bid and awarding the contract for the project. Um, attached to my report were, again, the recommendation letter and the, and the uh, bid tabulation. Um, so our recommendation, as noted, is to award the project to BWC Excavating as the lowest responsive, responsible bidder. Um, and also to award bid alternate A, which is the additional water main work that Iowa City has requested. Okay, uh, so we have uh, consideration of resolution number 2006, accepting bid and awarded contract for the Olive Court Improvements Project. Is there a motion? So moved. So moved by Casey. Is there a second? I'll second. Second by Doug. Uh, discussion. I, I just want to say that, uh, Josiah, you've laid out our options just beautifully, and I love your map and, and the uh, improvements that you're showing and you're prioritizing them. And you 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 kind of set a set the bar pretty high for the council. <laughs> and our our uh, you know we're we're going to be meeting with Karen Kurt, I think her name is of the uh, what she the. I, uh, East Central Iowa well, Council of Governments. East, East Central Iowa. East Cog. So we're going to be meeting with her at uh, 12 o'clock uh, tomorrow, I think it is. And we're going to start um, talking about how to set priorities, which I think you've done a great job at. Good. Yeah, thank you. Any other discussion? Okay. 
Roll call vote. Uh, Swales. Aye. Moore. Aye. Scott. Aye. Cook. Aye. O'Sullivan. Aye. Carried. Uh, we have consideration of resolution number 2007 approving a memorandum of agreement with the City of Iowa City concerning cost sharing for Olive Court reconstruction project. Um, is there a motion? motion? Motion by Bobby. Is there a second? Second. Second by Sarah. A discussion. I have a discussion item. <clears throat> so I know that we went back and forth with a couple late adjustments to the memorandum as we got some comments from City by with City, but the one change, and I don't know if everybody got the email that I followed up on, is that um, the cost sharing agreement as previously laid out, this, the City of University Heights will reimburse 3000 back to Iowa City for work that they're gonna do on our behalf associated with the street and the manhole. So if you have any questions, let me know. I don't want to rehash stuff you've already read, but I just want to point that out. Thanks, Josiah. Uh, any other discussion? Roll call vote. Moore. Aye. Scott. Aye. Cook. Aye. O'Sullivan. Aye. Swales. Aye. Carried. Okay. Well, this is wonderful to get this project going. It's it's been at least, I don't know, something like 11 to 12 years ago. Was it that many, Josiah? Well, that's when the agreement was made with uh, Jeff Hendrickson, looking towards the time when the street would be rebuilt. Yeah. I mean, it's so wonderful to get this going this year. And the other thing we need to do is contact uh, the Hendrickson uh, group, the Lytham condominiums in the you know it's the horseshoe in the area we we talk to them and uh, we should uh, send them a letter the right we've done that before and uh, I haven't run into anybody to tell them yet but I'm very excited about this project I know they will be too uh, e-government uh, Lisa you sent a beautiful report makes mine look bad color pictures <laughs> fancy with yellow arrows yeah it's just about the citizen request tracker mainly so that if residents are reading the attachments they'll know more about it and they'll use it and if you have suggestions we can talk about it sometime additional forms that you think would be helpful okay thanks again Thanks, Lisa. Uh, we'll go to community protection, and Chief is here, and Sarah, I know you've met. Uh, do you want to start, Sarah, or do you want Chief to start with his report? I'll let Chief go. Really okay. My, my report actually sums up everything. Did it, if you had a chance to read it, are there any questions about anything that's going on over at the police department? Uh, just real quick kudos to Lisa and e-government. We made some of those changes just before and in response to that last snow event. And I think the routing, hopefully, to Doug and the mayor, especially on the snow clearing, I hope that went well. You guys were kept apprised. Great. And from my perspective, we were able to respond to community members. And, and I'm, I'm hoping that that snowballs, no pun intended, or maybe pun intended, I guess, <laughs> uh, so that more people continue to use it. Uh, the cab, just real quick, I've communicated with Betty Andrews. She's the chapter president of the NAACP for Iowa and Nebraska. The last two days we've communicated back and forth. We're still hopeful that we can work out some dates for her to be present and participate, but she has also conceded that that might not happen and she doesn't want it to delay this process, so we may be moving forward without Betty. NAACP has to be part of the process. They sit on the board, uh, plus Kevin Sanders, the Iowa City area president, will be, we, will be part of that too. But, from my perspective, that was the most important thing in my report, and the rest of it stands. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, finance, I think Bobby's I think done with that. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, building zoning and sanitation. Mm -hmm. Now, Casey, um, we wanted to discuss some. I know we're running a little late, but we still can block off some minutes to discuss uh, city council goals. Uh, 
what do you want to do? Are we, we're, I know we're going to meet with Karen. We're going to meet with Karen. That that, that kind of plots our strategy, where we're going to go okay. from there. But I know all the street projects are, are prioritized, and, and there may be other projects, you know, that the, as the council come al- comes along. What we're hoping to do is discuss priorities. We're not making priorities. And, uh, and frankly, um, when we got a 30-minute meeting scheduled, um, a special meeting in March, what I'm hoping is that we can extend one of those meetings so that we can talk about priorities. And I know it, it, it's, uh, it's kind of a, a challenge to get over here and get ready and everything, and, and we do all that for a special meeting. Why not have it, you know, push it out there for 30 more minutes? Uh I know we talked about this earlier, and you know, since we haven't met with the executive director yet, um, I was thinking maybe it would be best if it would work on people's schedule for March 24th because we could talk about it a little bit. Uh, That's fine, That'd and fine. and you know, see where we're gonna go when yeah, we talk to I, her. I think it's just that you know, I think uh, Bobby and. Sarah and I mean, we could block out, you wanna, know, wanna another hour. Make some progress on that. That'd be great. You know, yeah. I mean, because really, I think the meeting will be f- five, ten minutes, and then we can go till the hour. We're perfect. You know, if that works with people's schedule, okay. So we're talking about that for March twenty fourth. March twenty fourth. So it, so it'd be at least you know probably till about eight fifteen. Um, so. Announcements? Are there any announcements? Um, if not, um, is there any objection to adjournment? Hearing none, the meeting's adjourned by unanimous consent. Thanks, everyone. So we'll be back on March 3rd at 7 o'clock. Thanks again.